Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time I started with a Romanian from left field, got misled in the Philippine jungles, chased a beautiful blonde clear to Venice, and wound up with a friend from Siam, all without ever leaving Los Angeles. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Sword of Cebu. Where is the office of Philip Marlowe, the detective, maybe? Yeah, sure. Right around the corner here to your left. Oh, thank you very much. Uh Uh, My friend, uh, you you know this Mr. Marlowe, eh? Well, yes. Yeah, I think you could say I know him. Tell me, he is a reliable man? Well, it depends on what you want to rely on him for. Uh, Excuse me, will you? I want to unlock the door. You are Philip Marlowe? Yeah, you're so right. Uh, Come on in, Mr. Uh, Never mind. Now listen to me. I will pay you twice what Henry Pound has offered to you. Also, I will add to that $1,000 for a bonus. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is this, Henry Pound, a thousand? Please, what? please, I have not the time for haggling. We make it $2,000, but you must work for me, not for Henry Pound. You only pretend to work for him. Now, look, bud, in the first place, I haven't heard from Henry Pound since I worked for him four years ago. Huh? Second place, I still don't know who you are or what you want. Huh? Maybe you better sit down over there, start at the beginning, and tell me. You are lying to me! Very well, Mr. Marlowe. The short, dumpy man with wild black hair turned suddenly savage, swung a hard fistful of knuckles at my front teeth and piled me back up against my office desk. By the time I got out into the hall, he was gone. I was going to follow him, but my phone, screaming for attention inside, stopped me. I decided to be philosophical about it. After all, screwballs find me all the time. Hello, Marlowe speaking. Phil, this is Henry Pound. Remember me? Yes, yes. I just had a reminder. I've been trying to get hold of you for two hours. My boy, where have you been? Out to dinner. Now listen, Mr. No, Pound, no, I me just... first, Marlowe. This is most important. What? I need your help again, immediately. Yeah, it no doubt includes a stubby crumb with a head full of wild black hair and a nasty temper that left you on the run ten seconds ago. Kurt Babesco. Whatever you call him, it's probably it. Babesco, Kurt Babesco, he's the one man I have reason to fear, Marlowe. Yeah. Come out here to my place at once, will you, my boy? Old Henry Pound's future is dangling over a very deep abyss by the merest thread, all because the sword is gone. What sword? What sword are you talking about, Mr. Pound? From the island of Cebu in the Philippines, the sword of Cebu. What? It means everything to me, and it's gone, vanished. I must have it back. Hurry, Marlowe. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, I pulled up in front of the walled-in jungle Henry Pound called home and zigzagged in through an Okinawan anti-evil spirit gate. Waded past a grove of dripping elephant ears and ragged banana trees and finally made the front door. The house itself, from turned-up eaves to thatched Nipa Lanai, must have been gathered piecemeal on Pacific Islands, all the way from Hokkaido to the New Hebrides. It was Henry Pound himself who answered the door. Oh, Marlowe! <laughs> you know, <laughs> the only thing wrong with you is I never get to see you except when I'm in trouble. That's the business I'm in. <laughs> well, come in, come in. Sure, sure. <laughs> hey, it's quite a place you have here, Mr. Pond. Uh, the islands, my boy, yes. <laughs> Since business keeps me away from them, I brought their atmosphere here to me. Even the music, huh? <laughs> All but the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoo shoo. Now, stay away from underfoot, will you? Go on, scat, scat. Shoo shoo, huh? <laughs> That's an albino Siamese, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's quite unusual. Yeah. <laughs> but he sheds that abominable white fur of his like any common cat this time of year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, did you see my servant, Hideki? Was I supposed to? Well, when I couldn't reach you by phone, I sent him down to your office to wait. Well, he must have gotten lost then. Well, no matter. Now, uh, let's get down to cases, my boy. <laughs> now, uh, sit down, sit down, will you please? And uh, mm. listen closely. All right. My uh, my major business, as you remember, is importing pearls from the Orient. Yeah, I remember. And uh, since you worked for me last, I acquired a partner, a fine fellow named Voss in Manila. Mm. With his contacts there and mine here in the States, we've been extremely successful. Was he the one who sent you that sword you mentioned? Yes, it arrived two days ago, but oh. uh, he sent over half the curios you see in this room. <laughs> That's why I failed to realize that there was anything uh, special about the sword of Cebu. 
Well, what is so special about it, Mr. Palm? Here. Read this letter I got from him. Mm. Henry, I'm certain now there's going to be trouble. From one Kurt Bibesco in particular. The man you saw tonight. Yeah, oh, I see. However, I've taken every precaution. Rest assured, Henry, that if anything ever happens to me, I shall somehow get the complete list of my contacts here into your hands. Mm. Sincerely, Eugene Voss. Well? Eugene Voss was murdered four days ago in Manila. Murdered for that list of Clara contacts. Well, you think the sword ties in in some way? Well, I'm positive of it. Oh. Well, what's it look like? Well, it's, uh, it's three feet long, Marlowe. The handle and the sheath are from the same gorgeous piece of white mahogany and uh, literally covered with intricate and exquisite carvings. Sounds wonderful. Oh, it is. When the sword is in the sheath, the two pieces form a complete pattern. Mm -hmm. I thought of it at once, of course, but when I came in to examine it again, it was gone, stolen. Naturally, I, I, I called you instead of the police. I've got to get it back, Marlowe, intact and without publicity. Why, that sword is worth... Uh, uh, what the... Hi, Dickie! Hey, he's hurt. Well, hi, Dickie! Oh, oh Miss Palm. Hi, Dickie, very sorry. He did not see honorable Miss Amaro. Hi, Dickie was attacked outside the minute he left. By a stocky guy with wild black hair? Oh, yes, yes, oh. not him, yes, yes. He find out where Hi, Dickie was going. Then he hit Hi, Dickie. That all Hideki remember until a few minutes ago when he waked up again. Oh, well, uh, do you need a doctor, Hideki? Oh, no, no, thank you. Just the same, Mr. Palm. Hideki already feel much better. Well, if you're sure, if, if you... Uh, if, <coughs> well, now you better go lie down uh, anyway. So, so, thank you. We wash head first and be ship shape no time. Yeah. Uh, very sorry, Hideki was well, such fool, Mr. Palm. Talk. Excuse, please, very sorry. Well, now... That explains how Babisco got to your office, my boy. He's our man, all right. Yeah, but I don't think Babisco has the sword. You see, he's looking for it. He offered 2,000 bucks to me to double-cross you. Oh. I can't understand it. Babisco is the only one who might know the truth about the sword. If he didn't take it, then who... Oh, shoo, shoo. You stupid cat, get out of there. Look out! Uh, look. I knew it. Now see what you've done. Broken my siling vase. Hey, he was playing with a piece of paper over there. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Eh? It's a rent receipt made out of somebody somebody named Saunders. Uh, let me see it. Sure. Received $40. Rent one month in advance for 812 Front Street, Venice. It is dated yesterday. Marlowe, I've, I've never heard of this Saunders person, yet this thing was dropped here in my house. Perhaps by our thief, Marlowe. Do you realize what a break this is? Dropped isn't the word. This was deposited. Oh, what do you it's mean? It's a plant. It's a plant complete with name, address, and date was left here by someone who wanted it to be found, because whoever has the sword of Cebu right now might also have it up for sale. I think you're right, my boy. Wait, uh, what do you plan to do? The only thing I can do, go to Venice and strike a bargain in our favor, I hope. I'll call you, Mr. Pound. <laughs> I pushed my way out through the jungle of my car, turned around at the dead end of the street and went down the way I'd come. At the first intersection, leaning against the lamppost, was six feet of lantern-jawed redhead in a turtleneck sweater and seaman's jacket. Gave me a hard, steady once over until I was out of sight. Later, halfway to Venice, I picked up a pair of very sticky headlights in my rearview mirror, but lost them again. I turned onto Front Street and finally found number 812 all by itself out at the far end. I parked a block away and walked back. It was a battered, rickety beach shack. I moved in gently and found a crack wide enough to look through. There was no furniture, just one big packing crate, a kerosene lamp, and a. and a blonde. Ho ho, what a blonde. She belonged in that joint like an orchid and a blacksmith. In one hand, she held a cigarette, in the other, a small automatic. I went quietly to the back of the house, found a tin can, and threw it. Then I plastered my back up beside the door and waited. She came out slowly, gun first, and when there was enough showing to get a hold of, I grabbed! Let go! Hold the gun, sister, come on, give! There! That's better. Now we can go in and talk, huh? You think you're so clever. I get by. Hey. Cozy little spot you picked. You got here, so it serves its purpose. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, Henry Pond's private detective. Where's the sword? Oh, we've things to talk over. Your first. bargaining position is lousy, Miss Saunders. What's the offer? Zero, baby. I'm getting it back for free. Now, where is it? Take your hands off me. The sword is here in the house, but the scabbard isn't. And one's quite worthless without the other, you know. You're not taking a lot of chances, are you, kid? The sword has already brought me $5,000, Marlowe. And I've only just begun. So make an offer. And make it good. You're a liar. So it's not worth one-tenth that. Not of itself, no. But this one's special, and I know why. 
And I'll tell you something else. You bet you will. You'll tell me where it is and fast. Not that fast, mister. Don't move. Hey. Drop the gun. Now you can turn around. Well, the lantern jaw with red hair. So you were tailing me after all. Ah, you said it. Now, wait a minute. Shut up. But I... Get out. The front door. Go on, go on. Beat it. I'll see you later. Now you, mister. Now what? Now we sit down, a couple of smart guys, and find a good, sensible way to work this out. Only I'm just a little smarter, because I got the only gun. Keep talking. What'd you say the sword was? Speak up, fella. Time's running out. Sounds like time's not the only thing that's running out, Red. Somebody's in the back room. Sorry, Tootsie, but now this only works one way. <laughs> I couldn't tell how long I'd been out. But I felt like I'd lost at least a weekend in somebody's boiler factory. I got back far enough to realize that something was going through my pockets. He was snaggled tooth, had a week's growth of beard, and put the room in need of a healthy spraying of sweet air. Yeah, yeah that, that's a little better. <laughs> I thought you was done in there for a minute. Yeah? Who are you? Oh, what happened anyway? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. Uh, call me Sid. Okay, yes. Sid. Yes, yeah, thank you. I, I, I was walking along the beach out there like I always do, and all of a sudden I heard a Ooh. scream. You know, like it was a wounded cat. Uh -huh. uh, it came from in here. And I know this house has been empty for years. Was it you who screamed? No, no, I went out too fast. Yeah. Well, I come a-running, and just when I stepped up in the porch, a fella in a pea jacket come charging out and beat it down the street. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Red and the noise in the back. Oh! Oh! Have you been in there, that back room? Me? Yeah. Sid? No, I, I just looked this far, and, and I found you. Yes. Hey, well, what, what's it all about, mister? What, what's back in there? Hey, bring that kerosene lantern, will you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Here, I, I got it. Look, a guy. Yeah, a wild-haired Romanian named Bibesco, with a sword of Cebu sticking clear through him. Dead center. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we continue with the second act of Philip Marlowe in tonight's story, The Sword of Cebu. While the beachcomber gaped like a marionette with broken jaw strings of the impaled body of Kurt Babesco slumped at our feet, I quickly covered the room in the back porch which led to the beach outside looking for the wooden sheath that belonged to the sword of Cebu, just in case Claire Saunders had been bluffing. But five minutes of that got me nothing more than a little exercise and a lot of salt air. Well, what should we ought to do now, mister? Call the cops? Yeah, I guess so. Sure would like to take that sword. So would I, Junior. But the homicide boys are kind of narrow-minded. You see, they like their corpses as is. Yeah? Come on, let's get to a phone. Yeah, okay. Nearest one's a couple of blocks away. You got a car? Yeah, it's out front. Uh, got a light? Yeah, uh, here's some matches. Thanks. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Huh? What do you do with the conga club? Me? Yeah. Oh, their matches ain't mine. Just pick them up off in that barrel. Just picked him up. Hunger Club, huh? You know where it is? Hey, sure, it's right here in Venice. Ex-Marine runs oh. it. Kind of wild, though. Cops raided it once. They had some dancing. Where girls. is it? Where oh, is it? Come on, it could be important. Oh, uh, straight down Front Street, Broadway, then left one block, and you're there. Uh-huh. Now, look. You call the cops and get back here and wait till they come. Tell them my yeah. name is Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective. Uh, yeah. I... Oh, oh, no. No, sir, not me. I ain't waiting here alone. Ten bucks? That's all? You heard me here. Tell the law I'll get in touch as soon as I can. Also, Sid, I'll match that ten the next time we meet if you've kept your mind on your work. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. But well, where'll I tell him he went to? The conga? You catch on fast. The conga, Junior. <laughs> What'll it be, Max? 
Uh, scotch and a little information. Girl named Claire Saunders, uh, dressed in a white linen. I never uh, heard of her, Mac. Oh. I see so many people, you know. Yeah, sure. Now you get what I mean, don't you, Mac? Oh, of course. Yeah. Well, you better make that a double scotch. I'm through. He should have known better. Trusting a fast dame with every cent of his war bonus, a jerk. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? War bonus? Yeah. Who? Who should have known better? Well, I. Uh... Hey, Sarge, I'm running out of ammunition. Yeah, I'll be with you in a minute, Kelly. Wait a minute. Look, who should have known better, Mister? My kid brother back in New York. He's a vet, Marines. Yeah. He got his check from the state and he turned it over to this Claire Saunders. They were gonna get married. That's what she said. And that was the last he saw of her. Oh, well, it happens every day. He'll know better the no, next no, time. Wait a, minute, wait a minute. I uh, just happen to remember. I know the doubt. You do? Yeah. Been around a couple of days now. It's pretty flush, all right. Know where she's staying? Yeah, sure I do. A ritzy motel about four blocks from here, the pavilion. Pavilion, huh? Yeah. She got bungalow 10 there, Mac. I know because she was complaining about it being the N1 and too long a run for the bellhop and a cracked ice detail. Oh. You go get her, Mac. And when you do, tell a kid brother that another ex-Marine tipped you off. Yeah, you bet I will. Bellhop, ice. Oh, there must be some mistake. And you made it. Here, we're going to straighten it out right now. Get your filthy hands. Quiet down, Duchess. Now, sit down over there. Doing as much as bad a false eyelash. While you do what? Take inventory, baby. I know you're alone because I played Peeping Tom before I played Bellhop. Chambermaids do a much needed job on bedspreads. All right. So it's under the pillow. So you've got the sheet. Now, what are you going to do with it? And without the sword. Are you kidding, Duchess? You don't think I missed that back room at the cottage, do you? You found the sword there? And Kurt Babesco, who's wearing the sword the hard way, through his insides. Somebody. Somebody was killed with a sword. Oh, come on, come on. It's a little late for that wide eyed pitch, baby. It doesn't your carrot top partner tell you every time he kills? Oh, Marlo, you got everything wrong. Oh, sure, sure I am, yeah, sure. But uh, just for laughs, let's pass it and you along to the cops, huh? Oh, no, please don't, please don't. I'll tell you everything, Marlo. Turner isn't my partner. He hardly knows me. That's better. Now, just who's Turner? The man with the red hair. Uh-huh. Oh, Marlo, believe me. I can explain everything. Okay, let's try it. Did you steal the sword from my client, Henry Pound? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Uh, Marlo, uh, let me start at the beginning. A week ago in Manila, please. All right, let's have it. It was late in the afternoon, and I was shopping for a handbag, just looking in store windows. When suddenly, I noticed a man hurrying down the opposite side of the street. A man who turned out to be Eugene Voss, Henry Pound's partner, maybe? That's right. Mm. I could tell he was afraid of something, Marlowe. He, he darted into a curio shop nearby. A minute later, I saw Turner. You know him? Just slightly. We, we'd met once. Obviously, he was following Voss. But he, he didn't go into the curio shop. Instead, he, he, he hid close by. And then when Voss came out, he shot him, Marlowe. Just like that, huh? He, he was gone before anyone knew what had happened. I ran over to Voss to see if there was anything I could do to help. But there wasn't. He was dying and... Oh, it was frightful. Please, Marlowe, I, I, I'd like a drink. They're on the desk. When you're through, go on, go on. What happened next? Well, he told me to take the money in his billfold, $5,000, to take it all for delivering a message. About the sword? Yes. I was to get in touch with Henry Pound here in Los Angeles and tell him that the sword which Voss had just purchased in the curio shop was on its way, that he should pay special attention to it. And then he died. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, you decided that 5,000 bucks was an awful lot for playing messenger boy, huh? Yes. So you said nothing to the police, grabbed the first plane for L.A., got the pounds place here, and swiped the sword, right? I figured if, it, if a delivering the message was worth $5,000, the sword itself would be worth a lot more. But you had no idea why. Oh, no, maybe a code in the pattern of the design and the jewels in the handle. Probably not the sword itself. Yeah, you figured right, little schemer. Here, yeah, here's your drink. Thank you. Oh. Oh. The rest of the, the rest story. of the story I can fit together myself. You knew you had something, but you didn't know what. So you swiped the sword. You left an obvious clue to an empty cottage. That rent receipt. You counted on it to start the ball rolling, and it certainly did. Who would that be? I don't know. Find out. Who 
is it? Turner, I want to talk to you. Just a minute. You still sure you're not partners, baby? Yes. I told you the truth, Marlowe. All right, answer it. I'll wait here in the closet with the door open wide enough for the barrel of a thirty-eight, just in case you've never been to Manila. Go on. Tommy! Tommy! Open up, hurry! Close it quick. That peeper may be around. Who? The one I slugged over at the cottage. He wasn't there when I went back. Just some bomb I scared away. Went back? Yeah, yeah, I went back. After you ran, there was some excitement, sweets. First, I slugged the peeper because I heard some noise in the back I thought was you. Me? I never returned to the cottage. I know it. It was a louse named Babesco. I got him all right. <laughs> With a very sword he was after. The little number right here in my hand. He was competition. So were you, sweets, except that uh, I doped your angle a long time ago. What do you mean? Well, boss told you something before he died in Manila. I stopped after I ran, doll. I even came back. I saw you go for his billfold. Saw him mumble something. When I ran into you again here in L.A., I knew you were swinging in the dark. It was a nice try, sweets. But you missed. Now give me the sheath. These two belong together. Come on, hand it over. You don't want me to be rough to you, doll. No. Here. Here it is. Well, that's better. Like I said, they belong to get together. Huh. That's funny. They should fit the... <laughs> What are you laughing at? <laughs> the answer, sweets, a slip of paper with a list of people on it. I think it's crumpled in the bottom of this sheath here, and that's why the sword won't go all the way home. Yeah. Here it is. A piece of paper. A valuable piece of paper. Sure, names what? and numbers of all the players. What? Hats and... Marlo. Marlo, he, he's dead, isn't he? Yeah. It's about as dead as a guy named Eugene Voss was last week on a sidewalk in Manila. Or the party called Bibesco. What is it? Turner's dead, but I don't think his partner is. Molly, you thought I was his partner. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, and I thought wrong, Claire. But now I got a little more to go on. I'll see you, honey. Oh, no, wait. What am I supposed to do? Call the police and explain it all away as a practical joke? Marlo, have a heart. Where are you going? Back to my client, little dreamer. I think you can give me a line on that partner. Be good. It was an hour plus driving slowly back to the transplanted world on Crestline Drive. And all the way, I kept adding and subtracting all the screwball figures I'd run into, hoping that someplace I'd find a mistake. But when I was there through the junior jungle and standing at the front door, I knew that my hunch was right. Marlo, you've got the sword? Sword and sheath alike, Mr. Pound. They're in my car. Also, I got news. The best goes dead. Uh, I'm not sorry. So is Turner. Tur well, I don't know any Turner. But why haven't you brought the sword and sheath in with you? Because they don't count, Mr. Pound. There wasn't any code in the pattern on either one. The answer was a slip of paper jammed down in the sheath. Here. Is that what we're after? Well, let me see. Yes. Yes, Marlowe, this is it. Oh, mm -hmm. I knew he wouldn't fail me. I knew Boss was loyal. I knew it. Oh, better than that, Mr. Pound. You counted on it. And don't move a finger, Happy. It's a great night for killing. Now what? go on. Into the study. We're going to use the phone. What? Marlowe, you're insane. Sure, sure I am. So much so that I let the hairs from an affectionate Siamese cat change my mind. About everything. Keep moving. Uh, the cat? What, what, what do you mean? I mean the Turner who shot Eugene Voss in Manila, who murdered Babesco out at the beach, who I just killed before he could kill me, had white hairs from a molting white Siamese cat all over his suit. The same kind of white hairs I got on mine when Shushu rubbed against me. Now go on, open that door. In other words, Pound Turner was a friend here, not foe, and from there on in it all figures. Or do you still think I'm insane? Yes, I... I... No, oh, Marlo, you're right. You bet I'm right. Turner was in this with me. A partner, you might say. You see, I knew that Eugene Voss was worried about competitors. Like Bibesco, go on. Well, I I knew that Voss would see I got his client's list, the pearl dealers, if his life was really in danger. And and... That gave you a brilliant idea, put his life in danger. So you sent Turner to Manila to kill Voss once the list was on its way. Oh, how neat. Tell me, clean cut, why didn't you let Turner know about the sword at once? Because he was tricked. 
Voss planted a fake list at his hotel, hoping that Turner would find it and go his merry way, which Turner did. He didn't know it was fake until he arrived here this morning. Which, of course, didn't affect the scheduled murder. Nice and thorough, aren't you? Or have you left out some little detail I should know, like why you bothered having Turner get mixed up in this at all tonight? I would have brought the sword and sheath back for you without him. I know you would, Marlowe. That's why I hired you. But I also knew that there was a good chance that in finding the sword, you would also find that I deal in opium, not pearls. In op... Oh, fine. <laughs> and Turner was right behind me all the way, ready to kill me if I found that out from, from say, Babesco, huh? Precisely. Uh. Turner was right behind you, Marlowe. Even his high decky is right behind you now what in you the f- dark. <laughs> you fool. Why do you think I kept talking here, kept confessing? Speak up, high decky. High decky, talk. He can't, Mr. Pound. What? High Decky is very unconscious. He's what? I hit him with a vase. A Filipino vase. No, no, you're lying. High Decky. High Decky. Pound, Decky. hold it. Pound. Oh, my leg. Oh, no. Oh. Marlo, you've got him. Marlo. What's the matter? Behind that, behind that curtain. <laughs> There's nothing there, honey. Oh? Nothing more than a friendly cat named Shushu. Oh. It took a long time. It always does. But finally, the police in Los Angeles and the police in Manila knew exactly who had done what to whom and why. All of which left Henry Pound, the vicious little character who wouldn't even recognize honor among thieves, with a short, unpleasant future. (laughs) And I thought about him and every rotten thing he'd done as I walked through his imported island jungle to my car. I thought about him and Babesco, about Turner, the houseboy, about Eugene Voss, and I didn't think about Claire Saunders until I got to my car. I was in behind the wheel, headlights on. <laughs> the words were written in lipstick the length and breadth of my windshield. Still, dear, I stepped out when nobody was looking. But don't fret, because from here on out, I'm going to be very good. I've learned my lesson. P.S. My plane doesn't leave until morning. Would you like to help me wait wait for it at the airport cafe? They have good food and they're open all night. Claire. (laughs) Airport cafe. It's an hour's drive. Unless I hurry. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Gerald Moore can currently be seen starring in Republic's The Blonde Bandit. Featured in our cast were Gene Bates, Junius Matthews, Barney Phillips, Byron Kane, Paul Fries, and Anthony Barrett. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time an old Spanish woman who cared, a redhead and a mink who didn't, and a green suede button beside a corpse, all led me to a wounded man with a gun in his hand, cornered on a warehouse roof. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where Burns and Allen are heard every Wednesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 